Good morning, Southside. <clears throat> Special welcome to our visitors. Grateful to have you with us on this glorious morning where we're doing all the ordinances that God has left to the bride of Christ. Uh, what a great Easter week we had. I was so encouraged with your faithfulness, getting out and bringing friends, family, neighbors, workmates, and bringing them to church to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Grateful for the choir and the worship team. I felt like I was going to come through my skin on that last song, uh, Up From the Grave He Arose. So thank you for all your labors and work in that. Well, it, it's the Lord's Day, and we are going to do baptisms, communion. Is it new members too, Sean, I think, as well? If, okay, so we're going to do it all. And so I, I got to help bridge the time. Um, so I'm betting against that, because we're, we're starting a new book, uh, Philippians, if you'll turn to it. And this morning, we're going to introduce that book to you. And then as a body, if Christ doesn't return and we live, uh, we are going to go through this verse by verse and uh, seek the face of God to understand his revelation to us uh, through the book of Philippians. So let's go to our Lord and pray and ask his blessing. <clears throat> Father, we come before you and I thank you for the faithful follower, the Apostle Paul, Lord, that you knocked off a horse and revealed the glory of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. God, I thank you for the profound letters that um, through the Holy Spirit he has given to the church for us to journey thousands of years later to uncover and see these glorious truths of Christ. God, we thank you that what we'll study is inspired by the Holy Spirit. I thank you that they are the words of God. They are the, your words to us. I pray that you will meet us in this season. God, I pray that you'll use them to conform us to the image of your son. I pray that you would do beautiful things, that the aroma of Jesus Christ would fill this bride. God, I pray um, that you would meet us individually. You would teach us excellent things from this word and you would meet us corporately and you would lead and guide us into faithfulness to our King. So God, we look to you to do more than we could hope or think. Please meet us and, and do powerful things through this word. God, we surrender. We want to be submissive to your word. Let us not change your word, but change our hearts and our lives through this journey. God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen. Well, as we begin, the, the question from my heart is why Philippians? And I'd like to answer that for you. I was kind of being led to Isaiah or Samuel, but as I was doing my devotions in Philippians, this letter just kept grabbing my heart. And then on our 25th anniversary, we looked in Philippians 3, where Paul said, there's one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I reach forward to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And we looked at just that laser to, to have this focus that goes right in and on Jesus Christ, and that is the call of the believer. Um, and just what God has been doing in my own heart in John 15 about the vine and the branch, we just hit pure gold in that section. And so I want us to learn how do we use the means of grace to grow in grace? How do we fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of faith and, and not just walk, but to run after Jesus Christ? And so I realize that Philippians is Paul really taking the Christian and sitting him down with this wise old grandfather and teaching us how to live the life of faith in Jesus Christ. I was looking at Philippians 1.11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. That's really John 15 and one verse. And that is what we're going to continue looking at and growing in. What does all the glorious doctrine of Romans that we've learned these last four years, and we saw that those truths were worked out in Romans 12 through 16 in a very practical way. And Philippians, I just see it taking it to another level. It, it, it's not just the conduct that springs from the gospel, but it's the deep relationship that the gospel brings you into in Jesus Christ, and in that relationship, the fruit that flows out of that relationship. 
And we will see that in Philippians. I was thinking of Romans 15, and in that, Paul shares he traveled 1,500 miles to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he endured many afflictions and trials. And he tells us why. He's going to bring us into his heart. What made you do that, Paul? Why could nothing stop you from going and preaching the gospel anywhere and everywhere? So we will get his personal testimony in Philippians chapter 3. He'll he'll open up how God saved him and what drove this man to live the way that he lived. And so I don't know about you, but I love to get in the heart and mind of someone who is faithful. I enjoy that with you, fellow saints, but I also love the missionary books that have been left to us. Uh, Henry Martin and, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name now. Who's the guy that I like so much that went to China? Hudson Taylor. Well, that's terrible. Um, (laughs) The, these missionary books have changed my life. And I think it's why we love the Psalms so much. Uh, in fact, in Philippians, I, me, or my will be used over a hundred times. I, me, or my, Paul's bringing you into his life, his heart. He's going to give you, he's going to let us read his diary. And I want it to be my diary by the end of this study, and I want it to be your diary. And so this is what I'm after in this year the Lord tarries and, and we live. It's easy to learn the doctrines of the Christian faith. You, you can labor and, and seek to understand them, learn them backwards and forward. You can teach them and you can memorize them. And all of those are excellent things. But you can do that and still not trust him in life and death. There, there is a way to learn all of those things and not trust God in your life and in your death. You can still not get to Philippians 4 where Paul's going to say, don't be anxious. And you can know all of those things and live every day in full anxiety. And so there's some kind of disconnect between knowing these truths and getting them in to where I don't live anxious lives 24-7. And then he's going to take, I think this whole letter might be moving to where he says, I've learned how to be content in all things. I don't hear that a lot in my journey. And so there's a way that to understand this truth where we can journey and grow. And my desire is that everyone in this room will one day say, I've learned how to be content in all circumstances. I read Jeremiah Burroughs just yesterday, and he said, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit, freely submitting to and taking complacency in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. I've learned that in all circumstances. That's what I want for Southside Bible Church. I want to be able to say I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so that's where we're going to be going, Southside. Do you want to live all of your days with a disconnect between what you know to be true and how you live into it. How you become like Christ in this world is what we're after. And Paul's going to start this letter and just say, I wish that you had grace and peace. And the more I meditate on those, that's all you need for the Christian life. And so I, I just pray that the truth of just that you would have grace, God's power in working in your life, and that you would have peace in your journey to glory. That's what I want for my heart and for yours. Grace and peace. And so Christ-likeness is the aim of this letter. It's my prayer. It's what I'm going to preach for, and it's what we're going to pursue. So let it begin with me. My prayer and hope is that you would labor in the Word of God, you would pray for these things, and in community, we would seek to work these into our lives. We need each other, and I pray that we would be locking shields and joining everywhere we can to grow in these things and not have this disconnect. Discipleship, to teach you how to walk in this manner, that we would hunger and thirst together for righteousness. So not as a ritual, but as a deep, deep need, I want to pray for our time in the letter of Philippians. God, I pray for grace and peace for this body. I pray that your grace would flow in a way that when we finished Philippians, we didn't just mark it up, but we've been marked deeply 
by it. I pray as we behold this Christ, transformation in every life. God, work deeply. Don't let us be content with disconnect between hearing and doing. God, you're the only one who can cause this. So we begin just looking to you for grace. And I pray for peace, that these things are worked out by those who know they're right with God, by those who have been brought under grace and have been reconciled and justified and joined to the Savior in a vital relationship. God, I pray that peace would fill the minds and the hearts. When we understand what you have given us and who you are for us, peace should fill and transcend our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray for a a restless nation and a restless people in Southside Bible Church. Give us peace. Shalom. Shh. Calm in the midst of a world that's unraveling and world wars are being threatened and earthquakes everywhere and the end times is preaching. Give us peace. Let us be so different than anyone else in this world. The ones who know their God and have no fears because all is relieved and taken care of in our God. God, please give us peace. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So my goal this morning is I just want to set the background and the history of this letter so that we might get the most out of it. There's some crucial things that Paul will write, and I think you're going to need this information to understand what he's getting at. I know some of you love this stuff, and some of you are going to get your afternoon nap early. Um, I'm going to ask you to stay with and fight because I, I believe it's going to really help you and bless you in your journey through this letter. So the first thing I want to start with is I just want to teach you about Philippi, the city itself. Uh, it, it's in northeastern Greece. It's the first major center where Paul preached the gospel in Europe. In 356 BC, it was established as a city. It was established by Philip II, and this is the father of Alexander the Great. The city's about the size of Vermont. <clears throat> the surrounding regions were loaded with gold and silver mines that make this such a major city. Philip modernized his army. He he had longer spears. He started learning how to charge with a cavalry, and he had better organizations than all the militaries around him. And as a result, it it just expanded his domain. And and like any good narcissist, he named it Philippi after himself. His son, Alexander, continued the expansion to even a larger scale. And the fruit of this is now there's there's this one world Hellenistic speech that went through that whole region and it made it more possible for the spread of the gospel because of this same speaking language. It's much like the printing press was discovered right as the Reformation broke out. Well, two centuries after finding Philippi, Rome captured Macedonia and divided it into four political districts. And Philippi now becomes this small settlement. In 42 BC, there was a historical battle of Philippi that took place between Brutus and Cassius, who they were the defenders of the Roman Republic, versus Antony and Octavian, who were the avengers of Caesar's death when he had been killed. And so there were two major battles, and at the end of that, Antonio and Octavian were victorious, and Philippi then is made a Roman colony. Antony was infatuated with a woman whose name was Cleopatra, which you've heard, the romantic Egyptian queen. And Antony and Octavian went to war, and Antony and Cleopatra ended up killing themselves together. And Octavian then became the sole head of the Roman Empire, and his new name was Caesar Augustus in 29 BC, which all of you should be familiar with that name. So what happened is Philippi is a Rome in miniature. Its inhabitants were mostly Romans, and they were governed by Roman law. The style and architecture were copied extensively. The coins bore Roman inscription. The language was Latin. The citizens wore Roman's dress. And this will be important even in verse 1 as we begin our study. So then I want to look at what was the religious life of Philippi as we start to look at this letter. <coughs> they, they worshiped the Greek gods. The main one was Zeus. And they had a devotion to the goddess Artemis. And then Isis, who came from Egypt. 
And in this city, there was a small Jewish community. And there was no synagogue at this time because 10 men were required in order to start a synagogue. And in Acts 16, 13, Paul founded a meeting place because there were several women who came and met for prayer on the Sabbath. And, and that was what it uh, was Philippi when Paul arrived. There's no spiritual life or anything in this city. The church now is going to spring up in the middle of this. Paul's on his second missionary journey. He's accompanied by Silas and Timothy, and they reach Traos, which is the chief port in Asia. And, they, and Paul now, he tries to go to Ephesus, and it says he was prevented. He tried to go to Bithynia, and he's prevented. He tried one more time, prevented, and then he goes west, um, and there he gets the Macedonian vision. Uh, if you'll turn with me to Acts 16, it's going to be important to our journey. So if everyone would turn to Acts chapter 16, you're going to see the church that's going to spring up in the middle of this. I'm going to begin in verse 6. They passed through Phrygia and in the Galatian region, having been forget, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when we had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So God leads them to this place. Now verse 11, we'll look at the first convert. So putting out to sea from Trios, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia, it was a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and we began speaking to the women who had assembled. And there was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. She's a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, and she's listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she had her household uh, had been baptized, kind of like we saw this morning. And she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So most likely, she's a proselyte to Judaism. She was a businesswoman, a seller of purple. Uh, the place of her birth was the, the heart of the purple garment industry. And this garment that she was selling, they were very expensive. And it was interesting learning that the, the dye that was derived from, the from a shellfish in the waters of Thyatira. And they would take from the throat, each shellfish had only one drop of dye. And so think about how many fish you'd have to take to make a garment. And the Romans loved this royal color. And so she came from Asia with all of her earthly treasures. And this day she found spiritual treasure as the Lord opened up her heart to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And her and her whole family believe and they're baptized. Second convert, if you'll look at me in verse 16, actually, I'll just kind of summarize it. Uh, Paul and his companions uh, met a female fortune teller, and, and she, she's a slave, and the masters made a great deal of money off her with all of her fortune telling. And so she had a spirit of divin divination, and she would cry out as they're walking around, and she'd say, these men are the bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And it says she continued doing this for many days. I think it was John MacArthur, he said, so Paul did not feel that he needed a demon-possessed girl to be his billboard. <laughs> and, and he says, uh, Paul was greatly annoyed. So I should encourage some of you, even the great apostle Paul was annoyed with this lady. And he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he comes out and that's when all the trouble started. The masters of this woman know we are no longer going to make money off her. So they take the, the, these men to the Agora, to the public square, and they bring them before the magistrates. And they call them Jewish troublemakers. And there's this hatred in that, in that region for the Jews. And so they, they strip them and they beat them with rods. They throw them into prison. And there's a jailer put around them to secure them. They're, they're brought into the inner dungeon where their feet are wide apart in these gruesome stocks and their wrists are put in chains that were bolted to the wall. 
And at midnight, they're doing what we would be doing. They're praying and they're singing hymns to God, all bloody and beaten, locked up in prison. And as they're in there praising God, a big earthquake takes place and the doors and the bolts and the chains are all opened. And the jailer wakes up and he, and he sees that the prison doors open and, and the shameful death that will come to him. He draws the sword and he's ready to take his life in verse 28. Paul says, don't, don't harm yourself, we're still here. And look at verse 29. And so he called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in the morning, the chief magistrate said to release these men and let them go in peace. And in verse 37, Paul says to them, They have beaten us in public without a trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison and now they want to send us away secretly? No, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. And so the magistrates come in their purple robes, and they're like, whoops, um, would you guys please leave? And Paul and Silas then leave, and they go on to Thessalonica, and Luke remains on in Philippi. But what a church that God raises up in the middle of this godless city. You got Luke, Lydia, a jailer, and an ex-fortune tailor. And this new little church has a love for Christ, Paul, and the gospel. And I think that's the, the passion of my heart, is you look at this little church plant, a replant, a revitalization of a church with the commitments of Philippi. And, and that's what I want us to get, is to reproduce this heart and this life into other regions and spread the gospel, just like how this began in Philippi. And Paul said he had every joy every time he thought about this bunch. And he visited them on two other occasions. It's ta talked about in Acts 20. Timothy kept him informed. He stayed of, of how they were doing. And he sent Paul gifts uh, to continue his work. And when Paul was in jail, this church in Philippi sends Epaphroditus to come take care of him and bring some financial support. Fifty years later, the church cared uh, for Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, in the same way when he was on his way to Rome and was put under military guard. The church became such ministers with the apostles and the spread of the gospel. Um, so beautiful. In fact, just look, go back to Philippians. I just want to read verse, chapter 1, verse 27 through 30. <laughs> Paul says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I, come to, whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. No way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you and that too from God. For to you it's been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. <clears throat> what a unity in the church of Philippi. The date and location was written when Paul was in prison. <clears throat> in verse 7 and 13 and 14 in chapter 1, he's writing from, from a prison cell. Evidently, Paul is awaiting a trial, we're going to learn, and he's waiting to find out, will they cut his head off or set him free? So this letter is going to be written with a man waiting to find out, does my head roll or not? The imprisonment was his first one in Rome. The place he was in prison had a praetorian. Those who belonged to the household of Caesar were told uh, Timothy was with him. In Acts 28.30, he was under house arrest for two years. There's soldiers there to guard him. That's why they, he could send and receive letters and get gifts and people could visit. Most likely, it's the later part of this imprisonment. The Philippians have heard about it and they've sent Epaphroditus to come minister to him. But one of the most amazing parts of this letter as we begin is it's probably one of the most uplifting letters that Paul writes. It just, it's, it's, it, many think the theme of it is joy. And he's just going to be talking about this joy and rejoicing in what God is doing. He's so filled with encouragement. And I think this is so big. How, how do you get there? He's just in prison and it's coming out. 
Luther's imprisonment brought a mighty fortress is our God. In the Bedford jail, we receive Pilgrim's Progress. And in the Aberdeen cell, we get the letters of Samuel Rutherford. And now Paul in a Roman prison, we get the letter of Philippians. And so I pray that these kind of thoughts and words and fruit will come out of our prisons and our altered plans and our hardships and our trials that um, not just grumbling and frustrated and annoyed. I, there's something so rich about how this comes out of a prison cell. And when I say I want to get to this place of, of what I know about Christ producing this kind of fruit, I, I just think as Americans, are we taking on the spirit of the age of grumbling and just always upset about something instead of taking up with Jesus Christ and you get thrown in a prison joy of how God's using my prison to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's just a unity with anything that spreads the gospel of Christ. So what we get in this letter is not a guy writing from an ivory tower, not a seminary professor from an overstuffed chair, not some pastor in a cozy building with air conditioning and no threats, but a man in prison waiting to hear if he's going to get his head cut off or not. And that context has to break into our hearts because that is what is available to us. If you think that's just Paul, we have the same Holy Spirit and truth. And there is a place that we can enter into and we can praise and worship God in every circumstance that he brings. That's what's available to us in Christ. So what was his purpose in writing? I need to get moving. Paul is sending back Epaphroditus and he has an opportunity to write a letter. He wanted to express his gratitude for their kindness, for the gift that they brought. And he wants to explain why is he sending back Epaphroditus? It's not because he was annoying. And so he wants them to know. So here's the reason. And he fell ill and Epaphroditus almost died. And that news got back to Philippi and the Philippians are so concerned about Epaphroditus and Epaphroditus wanted them to know he was okay because he loved them and Paul would be relieved for them to get him back safe. That's what the gospel does to people. It it gives you love and concern for one another and it's just flowing in, in this letter. Philippi was concerned for Paul who's awaiting trial and he wants them to know how he is. So he shares the events and he says, guess what? The gospel is advancing through the whole praetorium guard. No matter what the result of my trial, it's going to be for God's glory. And and he knows that his will, uh, that he will be acquitted at the heavenly tribunal. And there's no fear in his heart. He shares his future plans. I'm going to send Timothy and then I'm going to come myself. He warns them there are dangers of Jewish missionaries in your city. And they're coming to present the, the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're gonna, he's going to use strong words. He's going to say they're dogs. And they're always going to be those fighting the gospel of grace. With licentiousness, you can go live any way you want. Or with legalism, you got to perform to get God's acceptance. It's just going to be the battle. I fought it my whole ministry from within and without. And Paul's just saying, they're going to come at and try to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. You add one stitch to the garment of Jesus Christ, of your righteousness, and you've destroyed the whole gospel. Fight for it. Stand. Don't play around with these truths. There's a little leaven that will destroy the whole, lev- the whole lump. Stand fast and be united. There are internal disputes. I, I urge Judea and Sintike to to live together in harmony. Be humble, he says in chapter two. Be united, strive together in the gospel. Can you imagine such a thing that a church is struggling with with divisions? I always smile when someone is surprised about that. It's been happening since the beginning of the church. And Paul says, fight it. Fight it. With the unity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, let that be bigger than your hurts, your own agendas, and your own concerns. Fight it. Jesus is more important. He's more important. And Paul's going to say, unify in that glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Fight for it. I urge you, live in harmony. 
Paul calls them to stand against these enemies and fight them together. Fight them together. Why? The gospel's at stake. In the name of Jesus. Fight it. So all these things stirred Paul's heart to write a letter to the Philippians. God inspired this letter and preserved it so that you could benefit from the truths right now in 2024. I get so many letters and they're just garbage. You can win a free car, you, you tag, you know, just every, every day I go to the mailbox, 95% of it's garbage. But this letter is different from any other letter. It's the words of eternal life. These truths should change our lives and give focus and direction and strength and encouragement. Oh, what God has given us in the word of God. And we're blessed to come study this every Sunday. And will you treat it like it's the word of God? Dig in, wrestle, understand, seek his face alone, and together to get it into our lives. What is offered in this letter is unbelievable. And that brings me to my last point. What is the theme of this? And again, 16 times in the epistle is joy. Some think it's, it's peace. They have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Some think it's this concept of unity. Some commentators think it's the humility. A lot focus on our citizenship being in heaven because they were so proud of their Roman citizenship. Some think it's running hard in the Christian life. And I'd say all of those are a focus in this letter. But the theme is how do you get them into your lives? See, it's not enough that Philippians fills my life, but I'm asking myself, why? Why, why, why did not more of Philippians get into my life when I preached this 20 years ago? Because the theme is the only way to get this into your life. Just working at it didn't work for me. That isn't how God gets fruit in our lives. So how do we live this way? How do you pray and have true affection for one another? How do you have unity? How do you be humble? How can you be holy in a crooked and perverse generation? How can you be otherworldly? How can you be content in all things? Trust for all your needs to be supplied by God himself, to rejoice in everything and have peace that passes understanding. How? Well, this guy in prison, waiting to see if his head's gonna be cut off, writes a letter like this, and it seems like he's writing it on his wedding day. Can I ever have this kind of mindset? Can I ever live like this? Or is it just elusive for me and it's only for the great apostle Paul who was taken up into the third heavens? There is a way to be this kind of person and growing in it. And it's a narrow way. And that one way is Christ. And the theme of this book is Christ. We see joy and rejoice 16 times, but we see the words Christ and Jesus Christ 18 times in the first chapter and 51 times in the letter. This is one of the most Christocentric letters in the Bible. Paul just opens up his heart and he says, you want to see what makes it tick? It's Christ. He shows you a CAT scan of his head. And he says, I have the mind of Christ. He shows you your affections and he says, I count all things lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He shows you his running is, I run to Christ. He shows you that he can have little or much and be content because I have all things in Christ. He shows that all of his life, his Judaism, all of his accomplishments are dung compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. He shows you that he can look at death and it's gain because I'll get more of Christ. He shows his humility by looking at the humble one. He truly meant it when he said, for me to live is Christ. Cut him open and he would bleed Jesus. That's what I pray for. It's not enough to have a Christocentric hermeneutic. It's not enough to know that he's the theme of the Bible. There's salvation in no other name. And you have to behold him and know him and press on and abide in him. That's what I can't get over in the gospel is Jesus offers all of him to the one who will come and believe. And we're happy with some of them. And so I pray that we would behold Christ. The theme of this epistle is knowing Christ and the fruit that comes from that. So I pray that we go after that together. It's going to
give you a Newton quote and I'll let you go to the communion table with me. Newton said, our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, your pleasure and your duty. Since we have seen his beauty, they're joined to part no more. It's our highest pleasure, no less than duty's call to love him beyond measure and serve him with our all. Quoting that hymn in a sermon, Tim Keller followed with this question. What is it that has taken the whipsaw of John Newton's life between pleasure and and duty, and has joined them together. And he says the answer is a beauty. In other words, the gospel primarily doesn't give you a duty. It gives you a beauty. A beauty without which your duty will be impossible. You'll never be able to do it. Some of you have been trying your whole life with no beauty in Christ, and you're not getting there. In other words, long-term Christian obedience will fail, Keller said, if not fueled by the glorious beauty of Christ in the gospel. Apart from the revelation of glory, the Christian life has no combustion. The tension leaves a tortured life with putting right duty against selfish pleasures. And one polling left and one polling right, the beauty of Christ brings the two into harmony, rightly aligning into one pursuit our joy in Him and our obedience to Him. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And he's saying it's this beauty of Christ that marries duty and our desires. And Philippians is that book to bring those two into marriage. And Samuel Rutherford said, where can we find a match to Christ? Where can we find a match to Christ? Where can we find an equal to Christ? Where can we find a better among all the created beings amongst the earth? Oh, that I could sell my laughter that I could sell my joy, that I could sell all for him. Oh, Jesus, when will we meet? Oh, how long is it until the dawning of the marriage day? Oh, sweet Jesus, take wide steps. Oh, my Lord, come over the mountains on stride. Since he has looked upon me, my heart is not my own. He has run away to heaven with it. May he take our hearts away with him in this book. Father, we come before you. Oh, I pray, Holy Spirit, use these words to floodlight Jesus Christ. Let our hearts be taken up and let the beauty of this Christ marry our duty and our desires. Put the law of Christ within us. Let us walk in the law of liberty. Let Christ be the one that marries the two. God, give us eyes to see the fullness and the beauty of our Lord. God, I pray in this book that you will put him on display and we will look at him as a, as a diamond every week from a different angle. Let him be altogether lovely in our hearts and let it marry duty and delight. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.